So I'm going to talk about um, monitoring and assessment. Um, you know, we talk about water quality standards being the, the linchpin of the water quality programs. Well, they'd be nothing without the data to support them. Slight applause there. Standard disclaimer. <laughs> and so what does this session uh, cover? It's really a brief intro into um, assessment, um, understanding you know, what to monitor and who monitors, how the data is used, different designs, critical components, and what tools are available to assist you know, states and tribes and territories as they do their monitoring. So here's my little introduction. Um, basically, the first slide says that water quality monitoring is super, super important. It's the linchpin of protecting water resources. Um, states, tribes, agencies, territories have the responsibility in the Clean Water Act to monitor their lakes, streams, and rivers right, to assist in um, managing water quality. And um, really, we use them to identify where the problems are, where the problems aren't, and how to focus our resources. That's sort of the, the function of it. And it's not just where the bad things are, but just you know, how the state is doing as a whole, right? Um, both are important. Um, so this is the standard 303, well, it's a standard package that we always have. The slide is in every monitoring and assessment. And it basically shows how monitoring is important for every aspect of the Clean Water Act uh, tools. It's uh, important in standard development. It's important for 305B reporting and 303D reporting. And 305B is, as you probably heard before, you know, all the, you know, how the state is doing as a whole, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the 303D is basically the ugly. And um, <laughs> the states that are not meeting water quality objectives, we begin to have TMDLs, total maximum daily loads, to put the water body on a pollutant diet and eventually use permits and non-point source BMPs to bring these water quality uh, water bodies back into compliance because we're monitoring to see that things are better. So it's a whole cycle. So th this slide is really saying that, you know, monitoring is not just for 303D, it's for a lot of things. So it's for setting, you know, restoration priorities, right? So, you know, this place is good, but it's also vulnerable. So we need to go out there and figure out ways to protect that, uh, to identify emerging properties. If we're just monitoring for the things we've monitored forever, we're gonna miss things like CECs and nutrient problems that we're not monitoring for. Um, and actually, the third one is really interesting because it's, it's about developing models. We can't monitor the entire state of California. We can't monitor the entire state of Hawaii. We maybe can monitor the entire state of Rhode Island, right? So it's, it's really hard to do. We don't have the mountain power to be everywhere. So using monitoring data that we have to feed a model to predict what the water quality is in places that we don't have is a very, 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 very useful tool. We talked about using monitoring data to um, identify high quality waters in the anti-degradation framework and sort of set them aside for, for enhanced protection. Um, determining the effectiveness of water pollution control. So this is more, you know, you put something in place, a BMP, and you kind of leave, but you go back to monitoring, you find out in five years it's not working as well, so you've got to do some more where you find out that it's working just well, and that's great. Um, and then finally, the last one is sort of a trends thing. Right? Are things getting better or worse? And I will say at the front, there's no monitoring design that does this all. So you're gonna have to have mixed monitoring designs, focused monitoring designs, generalized monitoring designs to sort of put all these things together. And it costs monies, but it's worth the investment. So I think it was in 2005, EPA did two things. They set up this monitoring strategy framework. And they identified sort of 10 elements that are really important for states to think about 
when they're developing their monitoring programs. And, you know, first you've got to have a strategy, right? Um, is it just going to be done here? Is it going to be statewide? Um, you got to figure out what questions you want to answer because there's a ton of questions out there, so you have to prioritize that. You have to have designs that are appropriate to the question you're answering. If you're doing trends, it's different than if you're doing general population surveys. Um, this idea of core indicators is that you can't monitor everything, right? Money is limited, so it's nice to have a few core set of indicators that you basically use everywhere to sort of compare apples to apples. And speaking of apples to apples, that's where our quality assurance comes in. So if one guy is monitoring the apples over here and one guy is monitoring the apples over here, that's great. But if they're measuring the apples differently, it's not so great, right? And so things like inner calibration are really, really useful to make sure that when you measure copper and I measure copper, <laughs> we're getting the same number. And then when they go out in the field, we have trust that those numbers are right. So this is a really, really important and core part of any monitoring program. Data management, right, so bringing it all in, in is essential to taking the data and then making an assessment of it. If you can't get access to the data because it was done by this agency over there and he's got it in his bookshelf, then, you, then that data is basically invisible to you. So finding ways to create common data standards to share is a useful way to basically stretch your dollar because there's lots of agencies in California, lots of agencies in Hawaii, and they're all doing things a little bit different. So trying to bring them together in common QA and uh, common data is huge because that's when we get to do assessments. And assessments is really just turning the raw data into information. And then it's information that can affect management and affect change. We don't monitor for monitoring sake, we monitor to help programs make decisions. That's the whole key. Um, this thing about reporting, right? So we've done this assessment and I know it and I don't tell anybody, I don't tell anybody else, it's not good. Um, so we need to make this information available to management, we need to make it available to the public, we need to make it available to Congress and the senators and the people that actually see the value in these things and then support these monitoring programs because again it's essential to how we manage our water quality. And then finally this last one is uh, program evaluation. So you do this thing for a while and um, you have to take a sort of a step back. You had this plan, you went through it. How well is it doing the things you thought it was going to do? Are there changes that you need to make, or is it going OK? And then finally, infrastructural support. You can't do this on the cheap. You need to have the management input to provide the resources to get all this done. And again, this reporting is important to do that. So we put out this thing in, I think it was 2000, 2005, around that time. Um, also around this time, Congress allocated extra $106. Who knows what $106 are? I think everyone in the state? Okay. It's money to states to run their programs. So um, it was for monitoring initiatives. And so one of them is to help states build their strategies. So if you don't have a strategy and we're giving you money, I'm going to start scratching my head. And the second thing is we gave money to participate in these things called National Aquatic Resource Surveys. They're basically these large continental scale surveys to uh, monitor the uh, water quality of the nation and the states. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so here's where we talk about different designs. And these four design types is not a complete set of monitoring designs, but they're sort of you know simple, basic things um, that a lot of states have used. Um, so let me start with targeted monitoring because that's the one that folks have done forever. It's uh, I got a wastewater treatment plant. I'm going to monitor downstream. I'm going to monitor upstream, 
and I'm really going to focus on that. Well, that's great. So you know all about that little stream, but you don't know anything about the rest of your region. We just sort of focused in on how well that little piece of stream is. Now, the problem with that is states were doing that for 20, 30 years. And so when they did their 303D list, you know, and 305B reports, all they had was data that was bad. And so they reported it to Congress and they said, Hawaii has no waters that are good, which was, it made no sense, right? <laughs> so the administrator went to Congress and was asked that question, how well are we doing in terms of water quality improvement? And the answer was, I don't know. If you used the 303D list back then, you'd get a, uh, a biased picture because all of our monitoring was focused on the bad. Okay. So then came this, this idea called EMAP. How many people have heard of EMAP? It's the Environment, Environmental Monitoring and Assessment Program. And it was created by our Office of Research Development to really help answer that question that the administrator got asked 20 years ago. It, it attempted to use statistically valid surveys, right, to get a really good picture of how the states are doing. And so how did they do that? They took a book out of the statistics that are used by surveys. So Gallup asks people who they're going to vote for and then reports with a certain amount of certainty that, you know, 85% of the population, plus or minus 5%, are going to vote this way, and 15% with, you know. So that type of design was then applied to environmental monitoring. So instead of just going to certain places that we know about, we're doing probability-based sampling. So dots are on the map in a probabilistic site, we're sampling them randomly, and we're asking them the question, is this site good or bad? And so for every uh, parameter that we measure, we have a threshold to say, is it good or bad? And when you do this thing, you can get a statistically valid estimate of the condition of the state with 40 to 50 samples. So it's really, really a powerful technique. And so California has been using this technique for 15, 16, 17 years. Fixed site networks are really good for trend monitoring. So probabilistic surveys are good for sort of understanding what's happening at the statewide scale, but they're really quite terrible for looking at trends. So if you want to identify trends over time, the idea is to get a site and follow that site year by year by year. And what you're trying to do is eliminate the noise that's associated with location and just focus with the noise associated with time. And then finally, this last one is called rotating basis, basins. And it's an idea in large states they had trouble assessing the entire state, so they would just say, okay, in year one, we're going to do a third of the state here, in year two, we're going to do a third of the state here, and over year three, we're going to do a third of the state here. So a number of states use this rotating basin approach to, over time, get an entire state picture. Okay? So now I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail. Terry, quick question. Sure. Has there been a legal challenge to the rotating basin approach in any of the states? You know, not that I know of. It's a good question, though. I mean, because the foundation of it relative to the Clean Water Act is a little flaky. Yeah. But I think most people recognize it's that it's a, a, a practical solution Management. to a difficult problem. So uh, targeted sampling, selecting uh, one place or a couple place. You know, detailed analysis, you can measure this one place over time. 
Um, and as I said, you often focus on the places that we know to be not so great, you know, where we think there's going to be impaired waters, or we, we know their sort of sources. And, and this stuff is really useful. I mean, I'm knocking it, but it's really useful for fixing localized problems. You know, it's really useful for identifying TMDLs. It's really useful for the NPDES program to sort of understand what the condition is so they can do um, reasonable potential uh, analysis to determine whether or not there's a potential that the permit is going to exceed a limit. So, you know, that's very, very useful. And so it is employed at certain levels, um, but it can't be employed everywhere. Yeah. So fixed network sites are really uh, about trends over time. Um, there's a fixed site network that is a national effort. Um, and so uh, you can think of NACWA like a fixed site network. NACWA is the National Water Quality Assessment. They go to one site and they monitor the heck out of it. They monitor everything that they can. And really, you know, it's about trying to understand what's happening here, not just the water quality, but what's happening, what processes, you know, what's the flux, the, you know, the mass of pollutants that are coming down, what are the sources. So these are very, very useful, and they can be used for, for trends. And then I think I told you the story about statistically valid surveys, but it might be useful to talk about this just a little bit more. So um, we don't pick our sites, you know, based on what we know. We pick our sites in a randomly um, uh, unbiased way. We try to achieve, you know, spatial um, um, representation. Um, sometimes we focus on subclasses like, you know, maybe rivers or streams. Um, and then they're usually, they're designed to produce these scientifically <coughs> based uh, assessments of the condition of you know, California, uh, Region 9, the U.S. Um, and, and they focus on really, really broad questions. Um, what's the extent? What are the key stressors? And is water quality improving over time? But as I inferred below before, you know, it doesn't really do a great job of trend monitoring. Um, this was the, um, the slide that sold most people on the idea of probability-based monitoring, and this comes from Oregon. So Oregon was uh, sampling for coho salmon. They were sampling you know, spawning areas, and they were going to the same place, you know, basically near bridges, or places that they knew these, these um, salmon were where they were. So they'd go to the same place, and they'd estimate what the population was. And that's the blue bars, right? We know where they are, we're going to go, and then we're going to make an estimate on how well they're doing from these things. But really, the question your answer is, what's the population of coho at these places that we sampled? If you took the bigger picture, you know, how well are coho doing statewide? That's the uh, purpley ones. So um, the statistical survey approach really gave them a better representation on how coho salmon were doing in their rivers and streams throughout their state, not just in the places they were looking for. So that's sort of a, a good reason. Oops, I went too far. I talked a little about the National Aquatic Resource uh, Surveys. It's a partnership between EPA, tribes, and the states. Um, the precursor of this was the Environmental Monitoring and Assessment Program. Um, and then I, now it's being run out of headquarters instead of a, a, a of our Office of Research and Development. And it's really about answering three questions, which you can read out here, which is um, 
to assess their recreational and biological condition and changes over time in the nation waters using indicators of condition and stress. So, you know, condition and stress indicators. I think that's important also. The second thing is to uh, rank stressors based on the relative association between indicators of condition and stress. So we're monitoring both here. Now let's figure out, you know, in terms of correlation, which ones are most correlated with bad places. And then the, the last one is to sort of engage states and work with them to learn the techniques that we're using and um, to have a partnership. And I think that's the most important one. Terry, I have a quick question. Sure. Would you, could you, would you characterize the National Aquatic Resource Surveys as sort of a nationwide 305B report? I think that's a good characterization because, you know, that was in essence the beginning of it. How are we doing, Mr. Administrator? I do not know. <laughs> Start a program. Now we know. So thank you for that. One more question. Does the third objective only happen if the state chooses to do both field sampling and assessment in their labs with the 106 Part B funding they use for this? Yeah, I went to the wrong place. Yeah, that's a complicated question. So the way that we give out these funds is um, we randomly throw dots on a map for each state. It's more sophisticated than that. And then we say to each state, you know, you have 50 sampling sites we want you to monitor as part of this national survey. And the state can decide, yes, we want to sample all these sites, and we usually give them about $8,000 per site to do it. They can decide, no, we want, don't want to do them at all, in which case we send out a contractor to do it, and we don't give them the $8,000 per site. And then there's sort of the in-between, like, oh, we don't want to do the field, but we'll do the lab, or we want to do the lab, but not the field. So there's usually that type of negotiation. Um, the, you know, the partnership is really sort of a two-way. I think EP is sort of trying to offer these things up to states, and um, if they want to learn and help, they can participate. If they don't, they don't. And if it doesn't show, I'm a big fan of probabilistic monitoring. Um, and then this rotating basin approach, which I talked about before, dividing it into several geographic areas, sampling within these areas using any one of those three uh, designs, you know, informing your programs and your states, and then having this cycle go on over time. Um, I talked about core monitoring, core indicators, and, and these are the typical ones that EPA uses. Um, so there's a series of um, ones that are associated with aquatic life. It's, you know, biological communities, like the bugs that we talked about before, maybe fish, some basic chemistry, not super elaborate, but, you know, DO, pH, some cations and anions, hardness. Nutrients is usually in there, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, not soluble, you know, reactive phosphorus, you know, just total. Um, some habitat assessment, you know, I'm in the stream, what's happening on either side of the stream, and what's happening in the landscape, and so sort of provide context to the biological indicators. For um, recreation, it's usually E. coli or Enterococcus, depending on whether we're in freshwater or marine. Um, uh, we look to see if there's any nuisance plants. Um, we also do some nutrients and chlorophyll flow in the river or the stream. Drinking water, so you know, you can go through these. Uh, and then there's this fish and shellfish pathogens, mercury, chloridane, DDT, PCBs, and everything. So these are the things that, you know, we typically have in our national programs and we think that states should have in their state monitoring programs. Um, because if you really want to, you know, f find out if it's fishable and swimmable, you need to have these types of uh, things measured.
So these are very approximate costs, and um, I don't know how old they are, so you know, I won't vouch for them completely. But remember I said the other day when I was talking about the biotic ligand model that you know, sampling for those cations was pretty cheap. Um, what do we have here? 70 to 150 dollars is not a whole lot of money for a state. Um, metals, you know, let's say about 100 dollars. Priority pollutants gets expensive. Uh, bacteria is cheap. Tissue contaminants can be expensive, but most people are focusing on the things that tend to accumulate, so it becomes like either PCBs or mercury, those things that people focus on. Um, doing the, oh shoot. <laughs> yeah, doing inverts can be very, very expensive. Um, but people see value in it, so they continue to do it. Um, and then, you know, you can either use seasonal or permanent employees, and it, you know, it, it, it you, it's not just one guy going out there, you know, for safety reasons, and also it's hard to car carry all this equipment out into the field. So, um, there are costs associated with these things. Um, so Hey, that. Terry, I just want to say I think that at least the macroinvertebrate cost looks pretty low. I think it's probably gone up. And then I'll add to the list if you're doing um, toxicity testing, that's yeah. what, about 1,000 a sample-ish? That's about 1,000, yeah. Right. So yeah. Some of it is quite expensive. Yeah. So that's why you have to be um, very careful in what you're monitoring for. Let me go back to this other one. So we also have the core and then the, the other things that folks may want to monitor. So that was the toxicity, sediment toxicity, especially if you're in the coastal area. What is meant by landscape condition? Usually that is, you know, uh, a GIS layer or some understanding of, you know, I'm looking at a map and I know that the, this area is more like granite or, and there's not a whole lot of, you know, people around so it's fairly, you know, yeah, land use type things, they all fit into that aspect. You know, is it forested? Is it uh, agriculture? Those types of things. And it's usually done after the fact in the field. I mean, in the, when you're at home and you're looking at your GIS and say, oh. Um, so, you know, as you do these other things, they get a little bit more expensive. But again, depending on what you're trying to ask, um, these things can be very, very useful. All right, enough of that. Um, I mentioned the importance of quality assurance. Um, I'll tell you a little story. So 25, 28 years ago, I started working with wastewater dischargers in Southern California. San Diego, LA County, Orange County, uh, the Hyperion, uh, the LA City uh, wastewater treatment plant. And these folks had long-running, uh, high-quality labs, and uh, they did just a great job. Um, but in 1994, we decided to move away from the pipe-centric and really look at the entire Southern California bite. These discharges are all discharging together about a billion gallons of waste. And so we wanted to see, you know, not just what's happening here, but what's happening everywhere else. And so one of the first things we did is we said, you know, we want you guys, we don't want to hire contractors, we want you guys to do the work. And everyone said, yes, we have really good QAQC. And we made as a precondition that before you can analyze a sample, and it's not going to be your sample, we're going to mix them all up, so you might be measuring someone else's sample, that you do a QAQC. And they all said, yes, we can. And so we gave them a blind you know, sample of, let's say, PCBs. And all of these labs that were doing so well for 20, 30 years came up with different numbers for this blind sample that we gave them. So what that said is, you know, y yes, they're good labs. But there's drift, right? People do things a little bit differently. And so if you really want to make sure that you compare it apples to apples, the best way to do it is to do what's called an intercalibration. Before you guys start, you know, let's 
take this out, let's see how different you are, and let's work together to bring those things into closer alignment. And you would think that that was you know, a one-time, but no, it's improved the quality of those four POTWs monitoring for years to come. So there's a lot of things that we take for granted, like, yes, they got a QA plan, that's great, but it's not unless you really sort of understand what these guys are doing. So I just throw that out as a little story. Um, so data management, this is you know, an area that I'm not very good at. Um, I've seen a lot of flow charts like this, and they all look really good. Um, but you know, the basic thing is, you know, you're gonna take your sample and you're gonna, you know, do it on your computer. And in the past, most people would, you know, have it on their computer, you know, print it out and stick it in their shelf. But now what we're trying to do is have a sort of a more distributed system of, of data, whereas, you know, if everyone is collecting data, together we have a better picture. And so what folks are, are talking about are these, um, having these data exchange networks where people collecting data from all over the country can share their data through this data exchange network. And a lot of that can go through this EPA store rent, I have 15 minutes, and eventually be on this water quality data portal where we can all sort of see the data and try to understand what's going on. So um, that's the idea. Um, beware when you see easy flow charts like this because it's not easy and it takes a long time and a lot of work. Um, uh, we have one for the beach program, which I worked on for a long time and um, it's been going well. But people that work in your IT, they move on, right? And so you're always sort of training new people. And so you can't just set this up and forget it. You have to always make sure that if someone's about to leave, that there's a, a training period and that as the, I'm gonna use the word, as the schema changes over here, which is sort of the, how they want data, that the people over here sort of understand that. So it's a continuing thing. It seems like it's an easy thing to do, but it takes a lot and it's just, just worth it. So I just wanted to throw that out. Um, so turning it into information. Um, so simple assessments are great. You just compare it to the standard. Um, but states have listing policies. And, I, and I've never really quite understood the listing policy because, you know, we have these magnitude, duration, frequency numbers associated with our standards that say, you know, once in three years, that's our goal. But states have these listing methodologies that say, you know, yes, we know that there's exceedances, but we don't want to put something on the list until, you know, it's frequent enough. So they have like these 10% rules, like if um, more than 10% of the time I have exceedances, you know, then I think it's worthy of putting on the list because it's a long-term recurring problem that's worthy of um, effort rather than a short-term episodic uh, problem that you know, may go away. And, and then for things like nutrients where we don't have criteria, gosh, it gets even harder. And so, uh, that's when you start having these things called assessment frameworks. And um, so I'm showing one from the UK Water Directive framework. And, and it's a multi-dimensional um, framework where you take chlorophyll A and you bin things based on salinity thresholds, right? So we talked about classification the other day. And you have different thresholds. And these are actually different too, right? And so the whole idea, I should probably look here because it's harder, is to say, you know, if something is, you know, always bad, then it gets a very low score. And if something is always good, then it gets a very, very high score. So these sort of assessment frameworks are useful to identify whether things are bad or good. They can be used 
to uh, place things on the list. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Um, this is a, uh, an example of California where they have their 303D <laughs> report, and they're reporting it, you know, not just to the folks that are doing the assessments, but to the general public. So if anyone wants to know what water body X is, uh, if it's on a 303D list, or if it's been assessed, they can go to this website. And so I know a lot of states are beginning to develop these things. Um, and this is how the National uh, Aquatic Resource Surveys uh, are presenting the data. So, you know, one of the question was, you know, what percent of the nation waters are in good condition? And uh, based on several of these surveys, uh, this is the answer. So 56% 56, 56 of uh, coastal waters are in good condition. 56% of lakes and reservoirs are in good condition. 28% of rivers and streams. And 48% of wetlands. Um, now again, these are based on those core indicators that I mentioned before. It has nothing to do with chemical X or chemical B or chemical Y. Um, but just in terms of, you know, how we think in terms of biology, these guys are doing. That's what these guys are showing. I hope I did it again. And then, you know, taking the condition and trying to figure out what <laughs> stressors are associated with that bad water. And so for coastal waters, 21% of it is associated with uh, high phosphorus and water clarity and toxicity. For streams, I can't read it. 46 and 41 percent of it are due to nutrients. So there's just sort of the association, and that leads us to think, well, gosh, maybe those are problems we want to fix. Now, this is not causation. This is just correlation, or, or more, more than that, it's coincidence. And, but it kind of leads us to think that maybe these are the issues that we need to work on. Um, This is really about, you know, we have monitoring data and it's used by us geeks at the state and EPA, but really it's about telling a story to the public because they're the guys that are going to make, well, they have a right to know what, they're spend, what, we're, what we're spending the taxpayers' money on. And they care, and they could also be very important in helping us. Um, and there are tools like How's My Waterway, which you can go on this little tablet and figure out what's happening in my little piece of the world. Um, I think I already talked about programmatic review and general support. I just can't evaluate, I just can't emphasize how important these two are. They're the most underutilized pieces of a monitoring program, uh, and yet they're the things that make it tick. And then the next, slide of, next set of slides are a number of, um, of uh, tools that headquarters has been working on to help states with um, present, presentations, data, submittals, those types of things. And I'll, I'll just tell you that most of these are out of date by now, and this really needs to be updated. Um, so I talked to the guy who's whose slides these are, and he said, yes, I agree, but I don't have the time to do it, so um, just a disclaimer. Um, this concept uh, uh, still exists. It's um, this water quality framework. Um, this is folks like Dwayne Young at headquarters that are working to, um, to bring the data, the monitoring, and the assessment data all together and have it displayable, and um, so, He's using the Water Quality Exchange Network, which we talked about before, right? bringing data in. Um, he's using the data from the National Aquatic Resource Surveys. They're using information from the um, ATTAINS. Who knows what ATTAINS is? I think it's assessment, tracking, and TMDL, and a, something like that. 
Okay. Anyway, it, it, it wasn't it, worth the wait, was it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a system designed to take the information from states on 303D lists and TMDLs and have them in a place where headquarters can display them. And so in the future, actually, I think coming up this year, states will have to submit their um, TMDLs and 303Ds through the Satane systems. And so the goal of the water quality framework is, you know, we've got all these different programs doing different things to kind of bring it together for, for public display. Yeah, go ahead. What does it mean under action? If you go back on the slide, I know. Actions. What actions? Okay, so this is really just the um, you know monitoring assessment framework, right? You you monitor, you find something is bad, you do some rest you, you do some restoration Plan plans. Based you, on the you, assessment. Yeah, you take some actions to make the these restoration plans real. And then once you put these BMPs in place, you know, you monitor to see if they're effective. Attains is assessment tracking TMDL implementation system. Yeah, it's a tortured. Um, I talked about Attains, and I talked about the water, Q, uh, the water quality exchange. Um, this uh, data portal is available um, for folks to use to download data. Um, it has not just our stuff, but it has um, USDA and USGS data on it. It's basically what Storet used to be. Um, we have these data tools, I'm running out of time. Uh, and there will soon be this data analysis tool in R, which will help us um, do our job. Who knows what R is? Who can spell R? <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, and you know, the technology is changing faster than, than I can remember. So we have all these tools like Google Earth that are being incorporated in new ways. Um, and then continuous data is, is a big, big thing, right? In the old days, we had to go out every day now we have these sensors that we can put in place, and the, the challenge is, you know, how do you deal with the data from these sensors that are taking samples every, every minute, every 10 minutes? It's this huge data stream. How do you store it? How do you share it? And those types of issues are really huge. Do you have an answer for that, Terry? <laughs> I, I do not. Excel. It's not Excel. <laughs> Yeah. It's R. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we, we also have this environmental justice screen, which allows us to, you know, you can kind of look and see where um, uh, people live and, well, you guys know what environmental justice is, right? I'm running out of time. And then, you know, there's this whole world of satellite uh, imagery that, um, we have to figure out how to use. I know that uh, a number of states, including California, have worked with NOAA uh, to develop a, a tool that takes the satellite data and, and helps us understand what's happening with cyanobacteria in large lakes in the state. Um, I, that's coming out soon, I hope. Yeah. Yes, it's coming soon. It was in a beta phase for about a year, um, and they're just doing some finishing touches, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind yeah. of in trial at the moment. And, and this is huge, right? Because you know, before when we had to figure out where the lakes had high <laughs> microcystin, we had to go out and take a sample, come back. Here we can just look and see every week what's happening across the state. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned before, predictive, predictive models, I think, are gonna be sort of the future. Um, you can't go out everywhere, so maybe we can have some models to predict how conditions are in places that are nice, where we have a lot of data to protect. I don't think it really helps so much where places are bad, right? Because every bad place is different in a different way. <coughs> and, um, and we have this website that folks can use. It's in your package. 
We have a nice stream, and that's it.